undermining, undermining of the um, of the Supreme Court. That's a complete undermining of. All right, uh, Charles, we're going to have to leave it there. The Senate has just come back into session, and the president is live on C-SPAN one. Ms. Ayotte. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Baucus. Mr. Beckage. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Chiesa, Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Donnelly, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Mrs. Feinstein, Ms. Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Flake, Mr. Franken, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Heitkamp, Mr. Heller, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Isaacson. Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Kane, Mr. King, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Ms. Landrew, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McCain, Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Ms. Mikulski, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy. Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Paul, Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott, Mr. Sessions, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall of Colorado, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, Mr. Vitter, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden. The Senator from Nevada. I move a quorum. A quorum is not uh, present. President, I move to instruct the Sergeant Arms to request the presence of all absent senators. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be a sufficient second. There is. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayotte, Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Baucus. Mr. Beckage, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Blumenthal, Aye. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown. Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Chiesa, Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz. Mr. Donnelly, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Mrs. Feinstein, Mr. Enzi, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Flake, Mr. Franken, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, 
Mr. Hatch. Mr. Heinrich. Ms. Heitkamp. Mr. Heller. Ms. Arono. Mr. Hoven. Mr. Enhoff. Mr. Isaacson. Mr. Johans. Mr. Johnson, Wisconsin. Mr. Johnson, South Dakota. Mr. Kane. Mr. King. Mr. Kirk. Ms. Klobuchar. Ms. Landrew. Mr. Leahy. Aye. Mr. Lee. Aye. Mr. Levin. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Markey. Mr. McCain. Mrs. McCaskill. Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Ms. Mikulski. Mr. Moran. Ms. Murkowski. Mr. Murphy. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Nelson. Mr. Paul. Mr. Portman. Mr. Pryor. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island. Mr. Reed of Nevada. Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts. Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott. Mr. Sessions. Mrs. Shaheen. Mr. Shelby. Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Mr. Bitter. Mr. Warner. Ms. Warren. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden.
Senators voting in the affirmative. Baldwin, Barrasso, Baucus, Beckage, Bennett, Blumenthal, Blunt, Boxer, Brown, Burr, Cantwell, Cardin, Carper, Casey, Chambliss, Cochran, Coons, Donnelly, Durbin, Enzi, Feinstein, Flake, Franken, Gillibrand, Graham, Grassley, Hagen, Harkin, Hatch, Heinrich, Heitkamp, Hoven, Isaacson, Johans, Johnson of South Dakota, Kane, King, Kirk, Klobuchar, Landrew, Leahy, Levin, Manchin, McCaskill, McConnell, Menendez, Merkley, Mikulski, Murphy, Nelson, Reed of Rhode Island, Rockefeller, Sanders, Schatz, Schumer, Sessions, Shaheen, Shelby, Stabenow, Tester, Udall of Colorado, Warner, Warren, Whitehouse, Wicker, and Wyden. Mr. McCain. Mr. McCain, aye. Mrs. Fisher, aye. Mr. Cruz, no. Mr. Chiesa, aye. Mr. Markey, aye. Senators voting in the negative. Alexander, Cruz, Johnson, Wisconsin, and Vitter. Mr. Reed of Nevada, aye. No, I don't. Mr. Pryor, aye. Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Moran, aye. Mrs. Murray, Mrs. Murray, aye. Ms. Hirono, aye. Mr. Heller, no. Mr. Coates, aye. Ms. Murkowski, aye. Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Lee, no. Ms. Ayotte, aye. Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Corker, aye. Mr. Portman, aye.
Mr. Paul, no. Mr. Risch, no. Mr. Roberts, no. Mr. Coburn, no. Mr. Thune, aye. Mr. Cornyn, no. Mr. Scott, no. Mr. Crapo, no. From Mr. Rubio, no.
All senators voted. If all senators have voted, the yeas are 84, the nays are 14. The motion to instruct is agreed to. A quorum is present. Mr. President. The majority leader. Mr. President, as soon as I finish my remarks, we will enter, enter, enter into an agreement uh, how the speakers will uh, go forward. Mr. President, the shutdown of the federal government is now affecting some families more than others. And it's affecting families when the most vulnerable, denying them the benefits to help with funeral expenses of loved ones killed while serving our country. This is not a, this part of my presentation is not something I am got from my staff. This is in the press right now. The families of five United States service members who were killed over the weekend in Afghanistan have been notified that they won't be receiving their benefit, normally wired to relatives within 36 hours of the death. The death gratuity is extended to help cover funeral costs and help with immediate living expenses until survivor benefits typically begin. The money also helps cover costs to fly families to Dover Air Force Base to witness the return of their loved ones in a flag-draped coffin. Washington may be shut down, but it's still asking people to go to war, says the head of the Council on Foreign Relations, Gail Lemon. Quote, when people realize that they can serve and fight for their country, but their families will get an IOU until the shutdown is over. I think they're shocked. I know I am. For example, Lance Corporal Jeremiah Collins, 19 years old, was a Marine who died Saturday while supporting combat operations in Afghanistan. He was one of the five killed, including four troop members who died Sunday in an improvised explosive <coughs> device. <coughs> The law passed last week to continue paying civilian members of the military during the shutdown, but does not allow for payouts of the death benefits to the families of the fallen, officials told Andrea Mitchell of NBC. One senior official said he was disgusted by the predicament, but believes that's where we are. Now, Madam President, I've asked each senator to come to the floor today because it's important that we have an opportunity to talk about the crisis facing this great nation. This government shutdown is an embarrassment to our nation. Not only to the people of America, but around the world. An economic conference in the Far East that President Obama was to attend, he couldn't because the government shut down. So who is there pontificating about how bad things are in America? The President of China. And that's what he's talking about. America can't pay its bills. The families who lost five loved ones, it's an unbearable loss. But now they're being denied death benefits because of this senseless shutdown. It's shameful and embarrassing. There are no words to describe this situation that at least I'm capable of expressing. That America could fail the families of our fallen heroes. Appalling, frightening, Everyone can come up with their own description. But it's time for us, members of this august body, to stand before the American people and publicly discuss the path forward. Democrats stand unified, asking the Speaker to reopen the government, the whole government, not bits and pieces of the government. It's bad enough with all the sequestration that has cut, for example, the National Institutes of Health this year, $1.6 billion, and add to that the government shutdown there, 
Add to that the second year of sequestration will be another $2 billion from the National Institutes of Health. This premier search that we have in America for disease, there's never been anything like it in the world. The Library of Congress, never been anyone, any place like it in the world. The great library in Egypt was, didn't compare to the Library of Congress, but there has been nothing ever in the history of the world like the National Institutes of Health. And we are mindlessly going forward and cutting the scientists by billions of dollars. We need to reopen the whole government, not in some piecemeal fashion to, that further demonstrates to the world that we're unable to find real solutions. Open the whole government so we can get back to work. Allow the government to do its duty by our military families and by every American family. Mr. President, quickly, I said it before, in July of this year, the Speaker of the House of Representatives and I sat down in his office. I was there, my Chief of Staff was there, his Chief of Staff, the four of us. The Speaker wanted to figure out a way to go forward. We talked about a number of things, but the one thing he was firm in, he said it has to be at 2013 levels. I said, I can't do that. I said, it's $70 billion less than the budget we passed just a short time ago. So the conversation continued. September, we talked and talked. I spoke to Chairman Murray, to Chairman Mikulski. It was really hard. They had worked so hard to get regular order back in the Senate. But, like the good soldiers they are, we decided to try to talk to the rest of the caucus and swallow really, really hard because we had the assurance, I had the assurance, that we would have a clean CR now, in September. That didn't work. The speaker didn't deliver on what he said he would deliver on. So now the government closes. And we have one thing after another coming over here. We sent it right back. The last thing they sent over before a week ago was to say, let's go to conference. So last Tuesday, I sent him a letter. And in the first letter, I talked about a very decisive time in my life. I voted for the Iraq War. Within weeks of that, I felt I'd been misled. But regardless of that, that's how I felt. So I became an opponent of that war and did everything I could to focus on that war, which was having our military subjected to violence, and that's an understatement. Thousands were being killed, tens of thousands wounded. The number of Iraqis who are being killed is really hard to demonstrate adequately. There was a time came in my life that we had an opportunity under my direction to shut the government down. Why? By not funding the war. I made a decision, and that's in my letter to the speaker, not to do that. Now I, frankly, received a lot of hell from around the country. But that's what I did, and I don't look back at all. So I was trying to tell the speaker, don't do this. But however, I said, you've done it, and you've asked for a conference. We'll go to conference on anything you want to go to conference on. We don't care. But first you have to open the government and allow us to pay our bills. That's in the letter, last Tuesday. 45 minutes after he got the letter, I called him. I said, no, I can't do that. So for someone to suggest that we have not negotiated is just absolutely wrong, Madam President. 
70 billion dollars. It's the biggest compromise I've ever made in my career as a member of Congress, some 31 years. May not sound like much to some people, but it was really big. And my caucus remembers what I asked them to do. So for someone to suggest to any of my senators that we haven't negotiated is simply unfair. And to say that we won't negotiate is unfair. I put it in writing. We're happy to go to conference. But you've got to open the government. This is unfair, just like these five soldiers killed. So, open the government. Let us pay our bills. And we'll negotiate on anything you want to negotiate with. I've spoken to the president. I'm certainly not name dropping. I've told my caucus this several times over the last two days. He cannot, as president of the United States, negotiate on paying the bills of this country, the debt ceiling. He has, and I think there are senators over here, that he has sat down and talked to you individually and his groups to talk about a budget deal. There were many conversations in the Oval Office that I attended talking about a budget deal. He has put in writing things that he would be willing to do that, quite frankly, our base is not excited about. But he put it in writing. He is still waiting for the first sentence from the people that he invited to dinner and met with, the first sentence as to what they are willing to do. As said earlier, I'm sorry, late last week, by Haley Barber and Ed Gillespie, former chairs of the National Republican Party, Republican, now they, they said this, not me, there is a time now when Republicans have to start being for something, not against everything. So I don't come here to argue and, and badger people. Uh, I'm happy to talk about anything. Senator Murray will deliver a presentation in just a little bit. We know how hard she's worked. She has a respect to both Democrats and Republicans. But I repeat, when the speaker said he wanted to go to conference last week, we said, good, we'll do that. I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not a one-man show over here. I clear everything with my caucus, with rare, rare exception, before I go marching off into the blue. So we, I repeat, we're ready to go to conference as soon as the speaker reopens the government and removes the threat of default. He's got to take yes for an answer. You folks have to take yes for an answer. We're just as willing to sit down and talk today as we were this spring, and we are this, were this summer. And in the meantime, let's open government and live up to our obligations as a country. To that end, I'll introduce a bill to allow the United States to pay its bills with no preconditions or strings attached. I'll do that later today and start the so-called Rule 14 process. We may have our differences, Democrats and Republicans, but we should not hold the full faith and credit of this great country hostage while we resolve it. I'm, at a later time, Senator Baucus will talk, and I hope he repeats here on the Senate floor what he told us in, the, in our caucus we just completed. Great nations aren't guaranteed greatness. There have been books written about it. And he'll talk about one author, famous author, who recently wrote a book about how great nations have to meet expectations. We're great today. That doesn't mean we're going to be forever. How is this country going to look to the world community if we no longer have the full faith and credit of the United States meaning anything? I hope we can get Republican cooperation to move this bill quickly, that is the debt ceiling. If not, the process could take us right up to the deadline one day before. I'm optimistic, though, Madam President, that my Republican colleagues here in the Senate will filibuster this bill. I'm, I'm cynical by nature. That way I'm not disappointed as much as those that are optimistic. My friend, Senator Schumer, and I have ongoing issues. 
He is optimistic about everything. I'm cynical about everything. Uh, but I am optimistic, even though that's against my nature, that the Republicans are not going to hold the full faith and credit of the United States hostage. I hope I'm right. We need to reopen the federal government now, not 10 minutes before the debt ceiling is gone. We need to get back to the business of protecting American families, back to the job of legislating. We're not doing anything in here, this body anymore. This is our job to legislate. It's always been our job, always will be our job. Open the government, pay our bills, let's negotiate. It's my understanding, uh, Madam President, that um, this consent agreement has been cleared. We'll hear from the Republican leader. We'll hear at that time from Senator McCain for 15 minutes, followed by uh, Senators Durbin, Schumer, Murray. You're not going to get this, so if you just want to... I was told I could get it, so I'm offering it. I ask consent. That'd Is be... there objection? I ask consent. I ask consent that Senator McConnell be recognized. We uh, really don't need consent from him. He has time under his leader's run. Uh, following his statement, I ask consent that Senator McC uh, McCain be recognized for 15 minutes, then Senator Durbin for 10, Schumer for 10, Murray for 10. Is there objection? Madam President. The Republican whip. Madam President, I would ask the distinguished majority leader if he'd consider modifying his consent request so that we could alternate back and forth across the aisle. With that modification, I, I have no objection. Well, what, after we get this out of the way, you mean? Madam President, the majority leader has asked for us a number of Democratic senators to speak without any intervening speeches or remarks by Republicans. All I'm suggesting is after There's he and the, there, the Republican leader... I say to my friend from and Texas. And after Senator McCain speaks and a Democrat speaks, that a Republican gets to speak and so forth. That's all I I'm asking. I say, asking. Madam President, through the chair to my friend, three Democrats, two Republicans. It doesn't sound too outrageous to me. So uh, you would I object to that? Okay. Objection so, is heard. So, so, okay. So following Senator McConnell, I'll call upon Senator uh, Durbin. Madam President. The Republican leader. Madam President, I appreciate the comments of my good friend, the Majority Leader. The, um, I might say, however, that as much as I appreciate his comments to all of us, the real challenge is his relationship with the House and whether or not we can begin the discussion process to get to an outcome. <clears throat> Nobody's happy with the government shut down, certainly not anybody on this side and not anybody on the other side. But I would remind everybody on both sides of the aisle that Democratic senators have said repeatedly, Obamacare is the law of the land, and basically we should get used to it. We have suggested various modifications, uh, some of which enjoy bipartisan support, but obviously, so far, that's not something our friends on the other side are willing to do. But let me also point out to all of you that the Budget Control Act is also the law of the land. It was negotiated on a bipartisan basis, signed by the President of the United States, and the Budget Control Act is the, is the law of the land. And when my good friend, the Majority Leader, says he was negotiating with the House over the CR level, my view was that that was not a negotiation, that was current law in place, passed on a bipartisan basis, signed by the President of the United States, current law. So I think I can pretty safely say that nobody on this side believes that we ought to revisit a law that has reduced government spending for two years in a row for the first time since the Korean War at a time when we have a debt the size of our economy, which makes us look a lot like a Western European country. So as we go into whatever discussions we end up having to solve the shutdown problem, I would say to my friends on the other side, revisiting a law negotiated by the president, passed on a bipartisan basis, that is actually reducing government spending, ought not to be a part of 
the final outcome. But talk we should. The American people have given us divided government. And when you have divided government, it means you have to talk to each other. This is not 2009 and 2010 when our friends on the other side had a total hammerlock on all the government. We now have divided government. It means we have to talk to each other and get to an outcome. And I think it's far past time to get that done. And I hope given where we are today, that there's adequate incentive to get those talks started, principally between the majority leader and the speaker, to get us to the outcome that we all want, and to get us there soon. But let me just conclude by saying the Budget Control Act is the law of the land. If you believe in reducing government spending, it is working. My members and the American people think reducing government spending is a good idea. And so we have a law in place that is achieving those kinds of results. That's not something at a time when we have a debt the size of our economy that we ought to lightly walk away from. So, Mr. President, I hope my good friend, the Majority Leader, will, in addition to talking to us, which we appreciate, uh, talk to the Speaker because that's how we resolve this crisis. I yield the floor. Madam President. The Assistant Majority Leader. Madam President, since the beginning of this great nation, 1,948 men and women have served in the United States Senate. That service is a singular honor and carries with it an important responsibility. James Madison said, quote, the use of the Senate is to consist in its proceeding with more coolness, with more system, and with more wisdom than the popular branch. Throughout our history, it was this Senate, many times in this very room, that took on the most difficult challenges facing America. The creation of the federal judiciary, the abolition of slavery, decisions to go to war, and the advancement of civil rights. At each of those moments, skeptics question whether there were senators capable of resisting political pressure and whether there were senators prepared to lead a divided nation. My colleagues, this is our moment. This is our chance, our chance to bring this nation back from the precipice. We should agree to restore the functions of government, not in a piecemeal fashion, but in an orderly process befitting a great nation. We should spare America's workers and businesses the tragic consequences of a first ever default on our nation's debt. And we should restore the time-honored process of legislating, legislating, by adopting a bipartisan budget with the House, by considering spending bills on the floor of this chamber and passing appropriation bills in an orderly process, we can vote today, this afternoon, to go to conference on the budget and begin to resolve our differences with the House if we find our great nation, a nation which we have all taken a solemn oath to serve and protect. So let's agree to restore the functions of government, all of them. I've spoken with many of my colleagues and friends, and they are my friends, on the Republican side of the aisle. We've shared our frustrations of the current situation to a person. Each one of you has said to me, we've got to bring this impasse to an end. Waiting for the House of Representatives to save us is beneath the United States Senate. We have our own responsibility and our own opportunity. We can come up with bipartisan Senate solutions. We can show the House of Representatives the path to end this crisis. Why are we waiting for them to show us? Let's begin to restore the confidence of the American people in this institution, in the United States Senate. We can fund the government, we can go to conference on a budget, and we can extend our debt authority. I see my friend Senator McCain on the floor, and I know he's going to speak in just a moment. Over the last year, I have seen moments in the Senate 
where we've defied our cynics and our critics. Our successful bipartisan effort to pass a comprehensive immigration bill, an historic farm bill with far-reaching re far reforms, and a bipartisan extension of the student loan program, we came together and we found common ground. We led as a United States Senate. Now we need to summon the political courage and purpose to find a bipartisan way to meet this challenge. I know that it won't be easy, but I know that we are up to the job. I know that we have an opportunity here that comes once, perhaps, in a political lifetime. But I want to say this. What we're dealing with here in the Senate is not just another political dust-up. This confrontation is of historic proportion. Let us not wait on the Senate to, pardon me, on the House to find a solution. It is our responsibility as elected members of the Senate to find that solution. And the solution, I think, is clear. Summon the political courage and the sense of purpose. It comes down to us in the United States Senate. And throughout our nation's history, it always has. I yield the floor. Madam President. President. The, ma the Majority Leader. The order now before the Senate is Senators be allowed to speak for up to 10 minutes each. I ask consent that Senator McCain be recognized for 15 minutes. Everyone else would continue the other order of 10 minutes. Is there objection? Madam President. Without objection, the Senator from Arizona. I would also ask unanimous consent if we could return to the normal one side and then the other side as far as speakers are concerned. Is there objection? Is there objection? That's our plan. Without objection, the Senator from Arizona. Uh, I'd, I'd say, my colleagues, I'd bring your attention <coughs> to events today that that I think deserve our attention. The first one is a story entitled Grand Canyon Food Shortage Turns Dire. St. Mary's Food Bank has delivered deliver food boxes to Grand Canyon National Park today as a federal shutdown strands thousands of employees inside the park without work and pay. Grand Canyon, thousands of people inside the park without food or pay. In this great nation, we're having to have charities deliver food to people who are trapped in the Grand Canyon. And also, today, showdown, shutdown outrage, military death benefits denied to families of fallen troops. You know, the bene at least five families of U.S. military members killed during, <clears throat> during in Afghanistan over the weekend were given a double whammy by federal officials. Not only have your loved ones died, but due to the government shutdown, you won't receive a death benefit. You know, the approval rating of Congress we joke about, about being 12% or 11%. I have a line I use all the time. We're down to blood relatives and paid staffers. But shouldn't we, shouldn't we as a body, Republican, Democrat, no matter who we are, shouldn't we be embarrassed about this? Shouldn't we be ashamed? What, what, what do the American people think when they see that death benefit for those who served and sacrificed in the most honorable way are not even, their families are not even eligible for death benefits. I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed. All of us should be. And the list goes on and on of people, of innocent Americans, who have fallen victim to the reality that we can't sit down and talk like grown-ups and address this issue. I'm not going to take the full 15 minutes here because I frankly get a little bit emotional, but we started out with a false premise here on this side of the aisle, and that was that somehow we were going to repeal Obamacare. That's after 25 days of debate, including up till Christmas Eve morning, fighting against Obamacare. That's after a 2012 election 
where I've traveled this country with passion, the first thing saying, the first thing we're going to do when Mitt Romney is President of the United States is repeal and replace Obamacare, and the Ameri American people spoke. So somehow to think that we were going to repeal Obamacare, which would have required 67 Republican votes, of course, was a false premise, and I think did the American people a grave disservice by convincing them that somehow we could. And now 70% of the American people, according to a Washington Post poll this morning, disapprove of Republicans. But they disapprove of Democrats as well. And they disapprove of the President of the United States as well. And meanwhile, the Chinese, great role models of democracy, are now criticizing us because of a looming failure for the American government to pay its debts, both domestic and abroad. I say to my friend, the majority leader, and he is my friend, we use that word uh, with great abandon around here, but he and I have known each other now for 30 years. Let's find a way to allow the adversary, I asked my good friend from Utah who's a history major, the words of Abraham Lincoln, toward, charity toward all, malice toward none. Let's find a way out of this. Let's find a way that we can sit down. I don't care if it's appointing people. I don't care if it's the, uh, the informal conversations that we've been having back and forth. But there should be a way out of both of these dead ends that we are in. How is this going to end? We know how it's going to end. We know how it's going to end. Sooner or later, the government will resume, resume its functions. Sooner or later, we will raise the debt limit. The question is, is how do we get there? If there's anybody who disagrees that we're not going to reach that point, I'd like to hear from them. So why don't we do this sooner rather than later? And why doesn't the Senate lead? I have great respect for the other side of the Capitol, but I understand the contradictions that are there and the difficulties that the Speaker has, and I'm in great sympathy there. So why don't we get together, why don't we sit down and, and come, look, this body voted 70 to 29, I think it was, to repeal the medical device tax. My colleagues want to renounce that vote that they took on the budget? Why don't we use that as one of the areas where we could, where we could reach agreement? What about this issue out there the American people believe that we are under a different health care system than they are and ours is a better deal than theirs? Well, there's a number of issues that we could sit down and negotiate with an hour, within an hour if we will stop. Stop attacking each other and impugning people's integrity and honor. So all I can say is that let's start this afternoon. And I don't care who it is or, or, or how it's shaped, but let's sit down and get out of this so that these families whose loved ones just died, just died, will receive the benefits at least that would give them some comfort and solace in this terrible hour of tragedy. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President, Majority Leader. I ask you, Mr. Kemp, that those on the Democratic side be in this order. Schumer, Murray, Bacchus, Mikulski, uh, Warner, Cardin, Klobuchar, White House, Warner. Did I mention Stabenow? White, I, I, okay, let's go over it again. Schumer, Murray, Bacchus, Mikulski, Warner, Cardin, Klobuchar, White House, Stabenow. Mr. President. Without objection. Mr. President. Senator from New York. Thank you, Mr. President. And I rise here because we are getting very close to a time of crisis, perhaps one of the greatest economic crises this country has known. I have many good friends on the other side of the aisle, and I don't doubt for a moment their motivation, their desire, and their love of country. It's every bit as strong as those of us on this side of the aisle. And so I make a heartfelt plea. We must come together and avoid a default of the United States. Many have said, I've heard some even say on the other side, that default doesn't matter or it doesn't mean much. 
Well, let me explain the danger. There is a very real chance that if we default, there will be a recession greater than what occurred in 2008, and all too real a possibility it could put us into a depression. Let me explain why. What happened in 2008 was simple. Mortgage securities declined in value immediately, dramatically they declined in value after Lehman and AIG went down. Banks' balance sheets instantly flipped from black to red. Loans were frozen. Not only long-term loans, but even overnight loans, lines of credit. And the economy came to a screeching halt. We had to offer a huge, huge rescue or bailout to overcome that. But even so, interest rates climbed. Well, if that happened with mortgage securities, if it, it, the likelihood of it happening with treasuries is all the more frightening because treasuries are more widely held, more internationally held, and the currency of the land of the world. If treasuries were to dramatically drop in value the day we defaulted, or make no mistake about it, it could happen a day or two before, here's what would happen. The economy would decline dramatically. Things would freeze. Interest rates would go way up. The cost of a mortgage, the cost of a car loan, dramatically increasing, hurting every middle class family. Home sales would decline, auto sales would decline, hundreds of thousands, millions would be laid off. Why risk that? We all have political goals here. They differ. That's reasonable. And there's a time and a place, as the scriptures say, a season for everything. There's a time and a place to debate these things. It is not while our government is shut down and while our debt hangs in the balance risking default. There's a simple and logical solution which good men and good women on both sides of the aisle can come to. Let us open the government, let us pay our bills, and then let us debate every issue you should wish to debate. Nothing should be off the table. We're happy to go to a committee, a conference committee. The senator from Washington has asked, I believe it is 18 times, we'll ask again in a few minutes. Of course we want a conference committee where we can discuss things, but not, not at the price of keeping the government closed hurting millions of families in every way, not at the price, even worse, of defaulting on our debt. I would say with all due respect to my colleagues in the House, they have it backwards. First go to conference and then decide whether to open the government or default. No one, liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, could say that's a rational strategy if you care about the country and worry about the risk of doing these things. I understand the frustration with Obamacare. We would argue there was an election in 2012. We would argue that every Democratic incumbent had to debate that issue over and over again, as did President Obama when Governor Romney made it a major issue. The election didn't decide to get rid of Obamacare. But we understand how passionately people feel, and we understand that you will continue to try and do that. But as again, there's a time and a season. It is not the time, it is not the season, when the government is shut down or default hangs in the balance. So I would plead with my colleagues that we come together. We want to negotiate. We want to sit down and talk to you. We are eager to do it. But first, open the government, pay our bills, and then let's negotiate. I yield the floor.
Mr. President. Senator 